today. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Chris Frangione, who's uh, advised on a lot of innovation projects, is known for helping organizations do open innovation, exponential technologies, um, and, and use uh, crowds mm -hmm. to <laughs> advance innovation. Uh, Chris has led innovation engagements and workshops throughout the world for private organizations, NGOs, the European Commission, and the U.S. government. He has testified on crowdsourced innovation in front of both the House and Senate in the U.S. Congress. Uh, he serves on the board of the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy, where he also was the interim CEO. He is a senior advisor at the National Geographic Society and advisor at NASA and a distinguished fellow at the Simpson Center, where he also serves as the co founding co-chair of the Loomis Innovation Council. Chris served as the vice president of prize development and execution at the Exercise Foundation, which was the only one of these that I knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, where he oversaw the department that ex um, designed and operated Exercise to incentivize innovation competitions um, and many other kind of cool things I knew Chris from when he was getting his master's at uh, Duke in the both environmental management and uh, MBA program. And so I'm happy to have my friend back in <laughs> yes. New Jersey and have him here to speak today. Thank you. <clears throat> so what I want to do today is share with you a tool that um, we've been using across organizations to bring ideas in from the outside that in the past few years really have been started to get focused on uh, environmental challenges. And so this is not a highly scientific talk. Um, I don't like talking at people for a long time, so please feel free to interrupt if you have a question. Um, there's not a lot of scientific charts. Most of my information is based on doing this for nine years. Nobody's done real long-term studies on the stuff I'm going to be talking about, but we know it works. And so I'm going to make the biggest understatement of the day, right? Environmental challenges are hard. And the reason is, is that often there's no silver bullet. You need a portfolio of solutions to, to help solve that. And you need a diverse problem solver group. A lot of times, some people that might have great ideas are in a tangential industry or they just don't know about the issue. And one of the really interesting thing about environmental problems is you really need to engage and activate the public, right? You need to, you need to get them moving and you need to get them thinking about what's possible. And by the way, not only the public, but the potential end users, right? The, the people that could adopt this stuff. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And then, of course, with environmental problems, no single organization has enough money to do it, right? And especially with budgets getting cut, chances are we're entering into a recession. We have an administration that doesn't care about this stuff, right? So how do we leverage the limited financial resources that exist out there? And then finally, of course, you need solutions that are scientifically sound and proven. And I picked these bullets for a specific reason because they align with what I'm going to be talking about. If you do traditional grants and contracts to help solve environmental challenges, you can check many of these boxes, but not all of these boxes. For example, you're probably not going to engage and activate the public. Another example, chances are you're not getting a diverse problem solver group. You're going to go out to the known players, the people that have been very good at what they have done, the people that have the most amazing resumes. You're not going to go out to some unknown or somebody from the telecom industry, right? You're going to go for those. So we like to say that prizes, or which is a shorthand for open innovation, can help us leverage the crowd. And who's the crowd? The crowd is anybody out there in the world, right? There's a big gig economy out there right now. A lot of people that don't work for a corporation or that may never work for a corporation or has extra time or extra brain power that they could put towards a problem. So how do you incentivize, keyword incentivize, we'll get to that, and activate those people to help you solve these problems? They're going to do something. Maybe they're going to work with a dog walking app and go walk dogs, or maybe they're going to do 99 designs and design graphic design logos for corporations. But how do you incentivize them to support you? Right? So think about that crowd that's out there that can help you. Also, by the way, not all the smartest people at Rutgers. Right? They're not. And they're not at any corporation usually. Right? They're somewhere out there. And so how do you activate them? And so we say that 
prizes can help you activate the crowd to solve your grandest challenges. And so it's kind of a little history lesson. Prizes have been around for over 300 years back in 1714. We really knew where we were on a, on a latitudinal basis crossing the seas, but we never knew where we were on a longitudinal basis. And that led to a lot of shipwrecks. And we like to think it led to a lot of people dying, so the British admiralty was going to do something about people dying. But really what happened was they lost a lot of goods and a lot of gold, and so they said, oh man, we, gotta, we absolutely got to do something about this. Oh. Thank you. So the British admiralty put out a prize, 20,000 pounds, for the first person that could figure out where we were on a longitudinal basis. Create some simple tool that could say, here's exactly where we are in the ocean. And everybody assumed there would be an astronomer or a ship's captain that would win this was actually a clockmaker. He made a simple timepiece that could keep track. And when they tested it, he was four miles off from where he was expecting to be. And because he was a simple clockmaker, they actually didn't pay him. He had a suit to get paid. But he eventually got paid. Fast forward, back in 1795, Napoleon invading a lot of countries, right? Problem with invading a lot of countries and like pillaging and like burning things is you have to feed your army. Your army gets bigger. And so, they couldn't figure out how to feed their army. And so they went and put out a prize for that. And what they did was they said, okay, create something where food can last. And it ended up being a candy maker, Louis Pasteur, who actually created a technology where he would half cook food, put it in a can, put some sealing wax on it, and then boil it for 24 hours. Does that sound like something familiar? Anybody canned food? It's exactly what we do today, right? Interestingly enough with this one, he made 18 types of food, sent it out on the ship with Napoleon's army, and they taste tested it. Imagine if they like, got sick or something and like, died, he probably would have been dead. Actually, uh, prizes became a family tradition with the Napoleon's family. His cousin faced a butter shortage, and we have margin because of a prize. Fast forward to 1919, uh, a hotelier from France who lived in New York City said, I want to incentivize the first transatlantic flight, first person to go from New York to Paris or Paris to New York, nonstop. There were like nine attempts, six people died, all the aviators of the time tried, but nobody could succeed. And everybody did everything by convention. They had a two engine plane or a three engine plane in case one of the engines went out. They had a co-pilot and a navigator so that they had extra support. You know, they um, just went with the thing that was going to traditionally have the best uh, range, right? Actually, one plane crashed on takeoff because they were so confident of winning that they filled their, their plane with fine china and hot food. Because, like, when we land, we're going to have this feast because we're going to be so good at this. And they failed. And the person that won was Charles Lindbergh. The media loved to call him the flying fool. He hated it. But the media loved to call him the flying fool because he'd only been flying for three years and he did everything against convention. So instead of having a three-engine plane or a two-engine plane, he had a single-engine plane. He said, you know what? If I go out, engine goes out over the Atlantic, I'm going to die anyway. No big deal. Right? He didn't have a co-pilot because he didn't want to have to agree with anybody. Really, it was about weight. He sat on a wicker trail, chair. He trimmed the edges of his map so there was no weight. And he came up with a new way of dead reckoning so that he could fly right next to a storm versus out of his way. And he won. And he totally captured the imagination of the public. But more importantly, within a year of him winning, something like one third of all Americans saw his plane in person. And the aviation industry took off. But what did it take? It took an outsider who wasn't afraid of taking a risk to do something that experts weren't able to do. So prizes have really taken off kind of to face environmental challenges. And these are just some examples. And I'll talk about two of them later. Because of those bullets I had on that first slide, how do you excite and engage the public? How do you get a diverse problem solver group? How do you leverage that? So before, before I get into it, the easiest way to show you is to have ourselves a little competition. So one of my clients is NASA. I spend about half my time with NASA. So my kids currently are infatuated with the space shuttle. I don't know why they're not infatuated with SpaceX or Blue Origin, but they like the old school space shuttle. And I think the reason is is because we can fold it into a paper space shuttle and fly it around our house. 
I'm out of ideas. YouTube's out of ideas. So I need this group to help me figure out a new paper airplane, sorry, paper shuttle that I could teach my kids. You guys up for this challenge? Seriously, you up for this challenge? I'm going to make you get up because I don't like talking at people. So in order to incentivize you, I have a NASA patch and a NASA pin. Okay? And the guidelines of this are very, very, very simple. On this floor in front of me, there's a blue X. Over there, there are two blue lines. All I need you to do, and I'll show you on the next slide, is take out any paper currency that you have in your pocket. I know that for a fact that hundreds work the best. But take out any paper currency you have in your pocket, fold it into a paper shuttle. It needs to have wings because my kids are very focused on wings. And you can't use any other materials. And whoever gets closest to the center of that X will win this patch and this pin. Okay? So let me go to that side. I'm going to give you three minutes to do this. And everything else we talk about is going to be based on this. So if you don't have any money, get an investor, which means take money from one of your colleagues. Please put your initials on it. Okay? So anybody have any questions? I have to find my phone because I have to time this. Okay, the rule is you have to be in line by the end of the three minutes to throw your paper shuttle. Okay? I'm going to start my timer. Nope, has to be, has to be paper currency. <laughs> Specifically paper currency. Okay, I'm going to start my timer. In what sense? The money goes from the organizer no, no, that's exactly right. So the whole premise of a prize is the team spend all their own time and money in pursuit of the prize. We're not looking backwards. It's not a noble prize. We're not looking backwards on what happens. We're looking forwards and saying, you do A, B, and C, because that's what we want, and not D, E, and F, because that's bad. And when you do that, we'll give you the money. But we're going to incentivize you with something. And I'll get into the other incentives we give. So this is exactly the order the prize works in. Yes, more than patches of it. Okay, I'm starting in three minutes. Can so, you, you, can, you can throw multiple bills, but once it's thrown, then it's mine. You could practice on the side, but once you stand behind this line, it's mine. You have two minutes and 45 seconds. So, you feel free when you're ready to come up. Feel free to come up whenever you're ready. You have two and a half minutes. Don't be afraid. It's fun, and you could just win a patch and a pin. Which, by the way, with my daughter's first grade class, the patches and the pins are really hot commodities. So there's two blue lines you could see if you stand up and look, and then there's an the X in the middle, the closest to the center of the X. Whoever is the closest to the center of the X. You have two minutes. Two minutes. So you guys can start throwing. You don't have to wait for the two minutes to be up. But once you throw, leave it where it is. Oh, I like that one. That does look good. Oh, just leave it there. Yes. <laughs> yep. Whoa, that was great. So you have a minute and 20 seconds to get in line. If you want to make another one and throw another one, feel free to do that. Nice. A minute and 10 seconds to get in line. To the X. To the middle of the X, center of the X. Oh, that's the closest it looks like so far. Oh, we were aiming for the X. <laughs> I always have somebody like that. Trust me. It's totally fine. That's okay. Just try your best. I'm just wasting my dollar bucket. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, close. 40 seconds to get in line. Is there anybody that's still waiting to get in line? Nice try. Oh, taking it from this side, first person. Oh, that's legit. Oh, 
I like your wings. <laughs> very, very interesting. <laughs> hey, it's where it hits, not where it ends up. <laughs> yes. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> Close. Okay, so it looks like our winner is, ooh, this one. Whose was this? All right, so just leave it there for now. I'll give, it, I'll give it all back. But you didn't know you were going to get it back. Here's your pin and thing. All right, so Rachel, do you mind counting that for me? Yes. So, can I pick them up? Yes, you can pick them up. Okay, so what, what did we learn there? Right, this is a very simple example of a way of how prizes work, right? And you saw I got challenged, right? But this is exactly how prizes work. You're spending your own time and resources in pursuit of my goal. But in theory, my goal is a broader goal, right? If we're putting out, let's come up with a way to capture carbon from a power plant and recycle into usable product, actual real prize that's out there right now. So you're doing it in pursuit of something for public good. So what effect did the deadline have? I gave you three minutes. I know that works because I've done this enough times, right? If I gave you one minute, you probably wouldn't have tested yours out. You probably would have just thrown it, right? If I gave you 10 minutes, you would have iterated so many times and we wouldn't have had any of this rapid prototyping. What about the appropriate target? Again, I know this is about right because I've done this. Oh, there's one. There's a couple more. I've done this enough times. But if I put this out the door, open the door crack, would any of you competed? Raise your hand if you would have still competed. Probably not, right? You would have looked at that and said, that's too audacious. There's pretty much no chance I'm going to be successful. I'm not going to do it. But if I put the line right in front of it, it wouldn't have been worth it to me. That would have been too achievable. What about the reasons for competing? How many competed because you actually wanted that pin in that patch? Raise your hand. Yeah. How many competed because you wanted to brag to your colleagues about it? Yes. Yeah. How many competed because I peer pressured you into it? That's fair. That's fair. How many competed because you thought it would be fun? Right? So there's lots of different reasons why you get people interested. And we'll get into that a little bit more detail later. But there's, you want to figure out what are those reasons and help them get there. What about focusing a community? I just had 15 of you help me figure out the next design for my children. What if you could do that for a major environmental problem and have people from all different industries that might not have ever had an interest in the environment that you can engage and activate them and all of a sudden they care, right? So you're saying, let's, we're going to put out a North Star or a compass and let's all try to achieve that together. Now that might be not the whole solution. In fact, you never want it to be the solution because you want it to just be a minimum viable product. You don't want to ask the teams to do too much because they're paying their own time and money. You want to get it to that place where the market will take it the rest of the way, right? What about new innovators and approaches? Who has never thrown a paper airplane in their life? Oh, there's always one. Thank you. Ha what about not in the last 10 years? Five years? Anybody throw one last week? Two weeks ago. Fair enough. So, so, you know, you're getting all this diverse group of innovators. What about collaboration? Did anybody help each other fold their paper airplane? Anybody have investors? Right? A well-designed prize, and this is probably one of the most important things I need to nail into your head today, a well-designed prize is as much about collaboration as it is about competition. In the markets that you do these prizes, a rising tide floats all boats. So how do you get people to work together? How do you get interdisciplinary teams? And what about leverage? How much money is there? 80. So that patch and that pin actually cost me nothing because my client gave it to me. But if I bought it, it would probably have been like $4. And I just got $80 of aggregate R&D spent. I told you you're not getting your money back. You can have your money back. If you don't get your money back, we donate it. And so feel free to take your money back when we're done. But that's the point, right? We want this aggregate R&D. We want all these greatest minds to focus on these things. So talk a little bit about fostering communi communities and um, collaboration, right? So these are just some examples of some of the prizes that I've worked on or are out there. And the idea with collaboration is, how do you get people to support each other? In prizes I've worked on, we often will have team summits that are mandatory and the teams have to come and be together. And what happens there is you find people switching teams, you find people sharing resources because they're all in it for the same 
end goal. Yes, somebody wants to win. And by the way, I'll give you a perfect example. We were working on one in Michigan, which was about highly fuel efficient vehicles. And we did seven weeks of on-site testing at the Michigan International Speedway. Not all at once, but we did seven weeks. And we said to all the teams, if you want your own garage space, you have to pay for it. If you're willing to share a garage space, think your car, your, your toolbox, somebody else's car, somebody else's toolbox, somebody else's car, somebody else's toolbox, you get it for free. Out of all of our 200 and something teams, one team decided to have their own private space. And you know how far they made it in the competition? They didn't even make it past the quarterfinals. You know who that was? Tesla, right? And so all these other people are sharing resources. They are sharing their ideas. One team was translating a, a brochure that was in German for another team. One team gave a high school team a whole chassis of a car because they're all in it together. And what we also did was, what we talked about right there is we actually focused, focused that community. This is an important thing to solve. Let's solve it together. I talked about leveraging funding and investment, right? So how do you take a small amount of money and leverage it? These are just some examples of what we've seen in the past. This is actually very hard numbers to get. Um, I'm working on a project with NASA right now where we're getting really great numbers back from our teams because everybody defines their spend differently, right? But the idea generally is you get around 10 times the amount of money you invested into it in terms of the prize purse. Now there's operations costs, which we'll get into in a moment, but you get about 10 times. And some people will say this is super inefficient. Why do we need all this aggregate R&D investment? Back to that first slide. These problems don't have a single solution. So let's get a diverse population and portfolio of solutions that we can use. My favorite thing about prizes, and no offense to all you very smart people, many of you with PhDs, and many of you achieving higher education, but the great thing about prizes is that they democratize innovation. Oftentimes, the experts know what doesn't work, but they don't really know what does work. Mostly because they're stuck in their own, no offense, they're stuck in their own little worlds and they can't see outside of something. They've tried something five years ago, so they're not gonna try it again. A funder's not interested at, whatever it might be. And when you truly democratize innovation, you say, I don't care if you've had five years of experience, 50 years of experience, or five days of experience. As long as you do A, B, and C, and you do it better than everybody else, you win. And so what happens, as I mentioned earlier, is you get people from tangential industries. You get garage innovators. One of my favorite stories, which I'll get into a little case study later, I was interviewing, um, I'm sorry, I was there for an interview of one of our teams in our Oil Cleanup X Challenge. This is when I was still at X Prize. And the reporter said to this gentleman, who was a tattoo artist, and his teammate was a basketball coach, and they met when the tattoo artist was tattooing the basketball coach in Vegas and decided they were gonna try to solve this problem, join this competition. And the reporter said, how long have you been in the oil cleanup business? And the tattoo artist said, including today? Because today mattered, right? Today was significantly more than yesterday. Now, we do often get the, the industry incumbents in, and that's great, but you're able to get this whole diverse group. And again, because you, you don't care about a resume. So if you do a traditional contract grant, this is a highly scientific chart, right? On your y-axis, you have a probability of success going up, and on your x-axis, you have your value of an idea of a solution going across. And if you do a traditional grant or contract, you still have a really good chance of getting a good idea. You have a great chance of getting a good idea. Why? Because you know the players. You did your due diligence. You went through their resumes. You looked at their past work. You talked to the references. They're not gonna let you down. But you don't have an amazing chance of getting something really crazy and different because they're not necessarily gonna take a chance, right? They're gonna, they're gonna go 80% of the way to taking that risk and stop because they don't wanna let you down. They have contractual obligations. You also don't have a very good chance of getting really bad ideas, right? Because you know these players. You've done your due diligence. If you look at a prize or a challenge, it looks a little different. You still have a good chance of getting a good idea, but you have a much better chance of getting a great idea, and you have a much better chance of getting really bad ideas. But remember, under that orange line, there might be 10, 20, 30, hundreds, thousands of solutions. 
And under that blue line, there's probably one or two or three because you're only giving out a handful of grants or contracts. This is obvious, right? That's good. This also kind of is sometimes good. That's like the Jamaican bobsled team, right? Did nothing to advance the sport itself. I'm sorry, the technology of the sport, but did a ton from the publicity, right? So again, people will always argue with me and say, this is highly inefficient. I don't need thousands. And I argue against that. Yes, we do. Because there's a place in the market for every single one of these. Or many of them. I shouldn't say every single one. And even if they're not the winner, even if they're not the winner, there's still something you could do. And I'll give you an example, and then I'll answer your question. Back to the oil spill cleanup challenge. Do you guys remember Deepwater Horizon? That thing spewed out for 87 days um, back in 2010, right? Well, it took weeks to get the cleanup technology down there. We had a gentleman in our, in our competition. He was a fisherman in Australia. And he created a very, very fine net that could fit in the 55-gallon drum on the back of a fishing boat that he could deploy. Now, it didn't do as well as the industry standard, but it still was pretty darn successful. It got like three-quarters of the way of the industry standard at the time. Imagine if, ignore all regulations and how all that stuff works, let's just pretend those didn't exist. Imagine if, on the day Deepwater Horizon started, every single fisherman or fisherwoman in the Gulf had that on the back of the ship and could start cleaning up immediately. What less impact? So there's a place in the market for that. There's also a place in the market for the really expensive thing that cleans it up really quickly. So I'm going to pause there and answer your question. Yeah, of course. No, no. Feel free to ask questions. Yes. Yes. Sometimes uh, the business as usual of practitioners may not like the new, but they have the money, they have the power, but may not like, uh, may not like it, uh, the new idea, new technology, new whatever, mm -hmm. and then they may take it and put it on the shelf. Yep. So what do you think uh, is you know, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, so early question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I can, I, can, I can answer that now. So a couple things. One, there are places where prizes work and there are places where prizes don't work. And I'll get to that in a moment. Basic research, a lot of the stuff you do here, prizes aren't good for. It's too far from a market value. The teams are not competing for the prize purse. They're competing for the market. So we want to make sure that grants and contracts stay. You can imagine when I go talk to the federal government, one side of the aisle is like, prizes are great. Let's replace all of NIH grants with prizes. Let's, let's, let's replace all grants across the federal government with prizes. It doesn't work, right? It's a complement. It's a tool in your toolbox that can help solve these challenges. A great thing about prizes is it's sort of like the UL laboratory. You know when you plug in your computer and you know it's not going to blow up because there's a thing that says, you know, stamp by the UL laboratory? Prizes vet technologies. They vet solutions. They do the testing, right? They make sure these things work. And again, the whole point is you bring it to a minimum viable product, prove it, prove it to the end users, who, by the way, you talk to in advance, so you know what they're willing to adopt. You know what's on their mind. You know what they're going to accept. And I'll give you an example. We were working on an energy density prize with Google. And we went, to the, we went to the end users, and we said, OK, how you know, how, when would you invest in? They said, oh, when I see a whole pack, right? If I get this right, it's like cells, modules, then packs. And getting to a whole pack is really hard, right? And so we talked to the, we talked to the competing, potential competing teams. We didn't know if they would compete. And we said, you know, what can you do in this amount of time? And said, well, we can make like 20 cells. Well, there's a total disconnect, right? So we put them all in a room in a couple workshops. And we said, OK, let's figure this out. And the industry actually was like, actually, we totally would trust it with like 20 cells. Right? That's good enough because we know how to put them together. We know the connectors and we know what we lose when we do that. And we know how to put it in a pack. So it, 20 cells is perfect. So you want to bring it to the MVP and let the market take it the rest of the way. To answer your question, um, unfortunately, we can't control what happens after the challenge is over. Because these are all independent teams that own their own IP. So as soon as the challenge is over, they retain their IP. We support them to go into the market in many ways. We always design for after the prize is won. 
We support them to go into the market, but if they choose to sell to a company that's going to put it on the shelf, we can't stop that, right? We are not, we are not part of that. We are proving to the world that something's possible, and we are activating the public to take action. But what a business decides to do in terms of their own IP is out of our hands. So it's not, a, not the answer you wanted to hear, but it's, it's how it works. So if we look back to our prizes, I talked about a candy maker, a flying fool, a tattoo artist, a um, clock maker. We had high school teams. Would any of you have invested in them with a grant or contract? Chances are, probably not, for two reasons. One, you would have been afraid to, because they're too risky, and two, you wouldn't have known they existed. Well, actually, three reasons. And three, they wouldn't have known the problem existed, so they wouldn't have shown up at your doorstep to help, right? So one of the greatest things about prizes is that they influence public perception. So you spend a lot of time thinking about, how am I going to activate the public, right? How am I going to get them to do something? And I'll talk a little bit about what we did with um, National Geographic, but you know, you do a lot of marketing, you do a lot of media, you do a lot of things with high school students or elementary school students. Actually, we used to do a lot with high school students and we stopped because they were competing for our big prizes versus these little like $100 prizes, right? Because like, you know, in your cell phone, you have access to more information than Bill Clinton did when he was in the White House. You can 3D print a prototype for 50 bucks. You can do everything now. You have access to AI and all these other exponential tools. So the high school students are just as competitive as our other, of our other competitors. But you try to do a lot to really get them to take action. So you have to think about what is it that I want to do. And this is very different than a traditional grant or contract, right? Which is totally internally focused. Prizes are extremely externally focused. One of the favorite things about prizes is that they reduce risk, right? So a lot of people say they're risky because you're spending money on these operations costs and you may or may not get an outcome, right? This is from a professor at Harvard, and I just love it, so I use it. So when you do a traditional grant or contract, you define the problem, you find the right workers, you incentivize the effort, you, 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 you. And at the end of the day, tongue in cheek, you pray for success, because you don't actually know what you're going to get. With a prize, you define the problem, you still have to set the problem statement, that kind of thing. But then it's they, they, they. They self-select, they spend their own money, they do all that. And at the end of the day, you pay for success. Okay? Again, think of this as a complement to your other stuff, which is what I was going to get at next. We never want to replace the traditional ways of doing business. We just want to add to that. And so, for example, the organization I work with at NASA is called Centennial Challenges Program. They are a center of excellence. They are a consulting firm across NASA. Anytime anybody's working on a major thing, they are called upon to say, is there an element where we can use a challenge to support this, right? So right now, this administration is focused on getting back on the moon by 2024 and be there sustainably by 2028. 2024 is not that far away. Most people are buying, if you're buying a new car, you're buying a 2020, right? So they're looking at challenges and prizes to help that. And some of the ones they're looking at is, how do you 3D print a habitat on the moon using in situ resources? How do you survive a lunar night, which is like 320 hours of pure darkness, right? So they're using it as a complement to all the other work that they are doing. And they're also using it as that Apollo moment where you excite the public, right? So this is what I was getting at a little bit earlier, that the impact and a challenge comes both from the process and the outcomes, okay? Meaning, again, if you do a grant or contract, you're sending out to select a few people, you're not activating the public. So the way we look at this is, every organization has a set of unique assets, right? Um, this one I'm using as an example is actually not National Geographic, so we worked with them on this. So storytelling, convening power, um, their brand, the ecosystem that they have. And the process of doing a challenge or a prize actually reinforces all that because you're letting the world know about it, you're doing a ton of marketing, you're getting the public to take action, you're calling on people to do this work, and so it allows you to have these internal impacts, right? Recruiting more talent that feeds into your unique assets, seeding an impact investing uh, pipeline, which is something that they want to do in terms of their convening power and their brand, 
increasing fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. And you have this external impact, which is you're accelerating the innovation life cycle, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the fact that challenges are public facing really help with this. So I just talked a lot about why challenges are good, right? But it was all on, on the side of the person hosting the challenge. Nothing on the side of the person competing in the challenge, right? So teams are your heart and soul. I always tell my clients that when we're doing a challenge, whether it be NASA or National Geographic or a private company or whatever it might be, that the person putting up the money is not the client in the slightest. Those competing teams are your clients. You have to do everything possible to make them successful because without them, you have nothing. You're standing around and twiddling your thumbs. So teams are your heart and soul and the prize purse matters, but it's not all about money, right? If it was, why would the winning team and then Sorry X Prize, one of the first prizes I worked on, spend 27 million to win 10? Or why would the second place team in Ocean Health Challenge, which was about better pH sensors and democratized pH sensors, which by the way had a really cool, you guys might be interested in this, um, this was a prize about um, coming up with better pH sensors so we could understand ocean acidification, right? It's, uh, it's like the evil twin of climate change, is that what they call it? They, there's some witty thing, right? Um, and one of the teams came up with a surfboard fin that had these sensors in it. And it did not change how you surfed at all. Didn't impact you at all. Wasn't much more expensive. The cool thing about it is it could track your sets. It could see how long you were up on the board. It could tell when the board was upside down. It could tell all that stuff, right? And so it was this amazing thing. And they, they got some of the money they placed, except they're super idealistic. They want it to be all about capturing climate data, science data. And we pushed them, because we help advise organizations afterwards, we pushed them to be like, sell this to surfers as like a way to track their sets, as a way to like become better surfers, right? And they're like, no, we're only gonna go within this direction. And they're, they haven't been able to break the market because they're selling it as an hour focus, they won't even talk about the other stuff it can do. Right, but imagine if you had millions of surfers, probably millions of surfers, I don't know if that's true, millions of surfers around the world uploading data to the cloud every single day in all these different locations, right? And you're getting that constant data about the pH of the ocean. So back to this. If it was about money, why would the second place team take a $250,000 check and turn around and donate it? It's not. So all of you make investment decisions every day, right? Whether it be in your personal life or your work life. And there's a set of market incentives that make it worthwhile to invest. And there's a set of non-market incentives then make it worthwhile, worthwhile to invest. Maybe it's something you just care passionately about. And hopefully, that red line above is an investment threshold, plus or minus, right? Hopefully, that market incentives and those non-market incentives overcome that. And sometimes they do, at which point you invest. And sometimes they don't, at which point you walk away. Prizes can help fill that gap. But in order to get people to be willing to take that risk, you have to give a set of incentives to them, whether they're hard incentives, which I'll get into, or soft incentives. The easiest way to think about this are hard incentives are those things that if a team had all the time and money in the world, they could go out and purchase on the marketplace. Soft incentives are those things that if a team had all the time and money in the world, they couldn't easily go out and purchase on the marketplace. They're not commodities. It's just stopped working. Oh, there we go. So, whoops. Just decide to start working. Come back. There we I'm just going to stop touching things. <laughs> and then, there we go. Didn't touch anything. So uh, hard incentives, again, those things you can go out to the marketplace to purchase. Right? A lot of times we'll get people like Deloitte or McKinsey to come in and give free education on how to crowdfund or how to do business plans. This is worthwhile to them, by the way, because hopefully down the line, these teams will then hire them when they're companies, right? Um, access to regulators and stuff like that. Oh, again, things you could purchase, but are harder for you to do. The biggest one that I'll focus on is testing. Testing does a couple things. One, it proves that this is possible and then we can award it. 
Two, it's a huge incentive for teams. So I'm on the board of the Barbara Bush Foundation. We did a prize. There's 36 million American adults that read out of below the third grade reading level. That's 15% of the adult population. That means they cannot read to their children at bedtime. That means they cannot read the back of a medicine label. That means they cannot read a driver's license application, nor could they take the driver's license test. There's a lot they can't do. Two thirds of those were born in the United States. So we're not even dealing with immigrants here. One third are, right? So we failed these adults. Uh, Place-based systems showing up just like you do to go to school can only serve two million of those 36 million. Even if we could scale it up to all 36 million, there's no way they can get there. Multiple jobs, multiple kids, transportation issues, financial issues, whatever it might be. Yet, 75% penetration cell phones, uh, smartphones. In fact, most of that population only gets their internet via their phone. They don't have internet at home because they can't afford it. So what if you could deliver their education on a smartphone? When we launched this prize, two companies were on the App Store in adult education. Thousands on the App Store in child education, right? So we wanted to incentivize those child education people and other people from other industries to come in and do something for the adults. It's a silent crisis, which is why nobody was paying attention to it. So we went and we launched this, and the value to the teams was that the top 10 teams got tested on 12,000 adult learners in three cities, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and Dallas. That is something they could have bought, but cost millions of dollars. And actually, our winners, our top two winners, were able to get significantly more increase in literacy in one year of using the app, because we did it over a year, than they would have in one year of going to a place-based system. If they got 50% of the way there or 25% of the way there, we still would have called it a win, because they're not going to a place-based system, right? Another example, Elon Musk put up $15 million to do a very similar thing with kids that have limited access to schools or teachers overseas. So in Tanzania, we met with all the village mamas, that's what they call them, built solar infrastructure in hundreds of villages in Tanzania, and tested these solutions different competition, different solutions, on 4,000 kids over an 18-month period and showed that they can learn how to read and they can learn how to do numeracy from a tablet. Most of it was like game-oriented. So that's what's of value to these teams. The soft incentives, again, are those things that they can't really go out to the marketplace to buy. And these are the things about like making a cause or being part of something bigger or finding new team members or a community, et cetera, et cetera. And so what you have to do is when you're thinking about a prize is you have to actually talk to your potential competing teams and understand what the incentives are that they need to compete. Whether that be money, whether that be education, whatever that may be. So the way we look at it is we say successful prizes find the sweet spot on some spectrums. Are you looking for a transformational change or an incremental change? Are you looking for something super audacious or achievable? I'll give you a perfect example. When we launched the Ansari X Prize, which is one back in 2004, um, this was about getting to suborbital space flight, right? 100 kilometers up, privately funded, twice in two weeks. Why was it twice in two weeks? That means it has to be a reusable spacecraft. JetBlue can turn their planes around in 20 minutes, can't change, turn a space shuttle around in 20 minutes, takes a whole year. So if you do two weeks, then you're building a business model, right? Originally, it was designed to be 100 miles up. 100 miles up is actual orbit. Suborbital is 100 kilometers. When we did the thermodynamic blah, blah, blah calculations, we realized that was really, really hard and we weren't going to have anybody competing. So we changed it to 100 kilometers, which is still really hard, much more achievable. By the way, nobody in the US knows the difference between 100 kilometers and 100 miles anyway, so it was totally cool. But it was a, we were able to get competing teams. How big is the follow-on market? Is the follow-on market small or large? You're going to say this is reversed. It's not. I promise I'll explain it in a minute. And are you asking for IP or no IP? Right? And the further you are to the right of this, the bigger the purse you have to give, the more time you have to give the teams, and the more of those operational incentives, those hard and soft incentives you have to offer. Why? If it's a small market, they're competing for the prize and not the market. By the way, if it's a small market, you shouldn't do a prize. Perfect example I was working with um, the WHO. They wanted to do a tuberculosis diagnostic prize, something that would show up in an hour or two versus a week. You know, many of these people had to walk a few days or a few hours to get to the testing center. They're not coming back. Problem is, the only purchaser of that is the WHO. 
Market's this small. Use your $10 million, go out, find some doctors, create this thing. Nobody's gonna compete for it, right? Because the market's too small. You take all their IP away from them, they're competing for the prize purse. All the prizes I work on have zero IP encumbrance, even when I work with a corporation. Because I believe it totally limits the ability. Now, that doesn't mean that corporation can't invest in them, that's fine. But you can't require it from them because they're not gonna compete. So, a few things of note, and then I'll go into some very brief case studies. One, you need to define the problem, not the solution. Our brains are wired to, wired to solve problems, right? We're wired to deal with crises and solve a problem. Oh, there's a tiger that's gonna eat me. Let me pick up my spear and kill it, right? But when you're doing a prize, the moment you define a solution, you limit innovation. When you define a problem, let's do A, B, and C, but not D, E, and F, because that's bad. Yes, it might have to fit in this box because it has to go on a spacecraft that can't hold something bigger than this, and it can't weigh more than that, fine. But whatever you do is up to you. Adjacent but achievable, I just gave that example. Clear measure of success. The teams are competing, spending their own time and money. They have to know when they win. They did A, B, and C better than everybody else. It's clear, right? You have to design for after the prize is won. Oh, sorry, this is a winning moment. You have to design for a winning moment, something to engage the public. A lot of competitions will have head-to-head -head things at the very end to really engage the public. And you have to design for after the prize is won. If all these solutions happen, and then they're put on a shelf and wither and die, not because they were invested in, somebody bought it and killed it, but because they didn't have the ability to go forward, then you failed. You wasted your time. Right? So what can you do to help them go the rest of the way? Is it put a trade association together? Is it taking them on the road show? Is it trying to put them in front of funders? Is it putting them in front of regulators? And you have to make it easy for your operator. These are not easy things to, uh, to do. And then of course, rewarding and simple for the teams to compete. They're spending their own time and money. So let's see it in action. I gave you a little bit of insight into this. Everybody knows what this is to you? Maybe it's easier to see here. Yes, Mad Men was very popular at that time. 87 days, that thing sat in the bottom right-hand corner of your TV, right? It went from the surreal to sublime, or the sublime to surreal, I can't remember which way it goes. So we said, you know what? Let's do something about this. Because the technology that was used to clean up Deepwater Horizon was the same technology that was in mothballs and used for Exxon Valdez 23-ish years earlier. Makes sense, you don't really need to have a lot of oil spill cleanup technology around, but there was no innovation. There was no incentive for innovation. There was no carrot for innovation. There was no stick for innovation. So we said, you know what, let's try this. So we wanted to show what was possible. We wanted the market to start making a difference. We wanted to show regulators, hey, next time this happens, they better not be using that old equipment because there's better things out there, right? And so we had a 15 month timeline and we said, okay, you had to get two times above the industry standard on how fast it picked up the oil, the oil recovery rate. And when you picked it up, 70, at least 70% of that had to be oil. 30% could be water. Because once it's filled, it comes back to shore as hazardous waste. The biggest incentive to his teams was we tested 10 days at, actually right near my house now, um, US Naval Earl Base, US Earl Naval Base. It is a giant swimming pool about 300 feet long where we could just dump oil in. Because you know, funny thing is you can't just dump oil in the ocean and be like, we're gonna clean this up as part of the price, it's cool. They don't like that. So, the teams, this was on the naval base that sends all of our munitions over to Europe. Which means it's a highly secure base. In fact, all of our pictures are taken from one way. Because if we take pictures the other way, you see the pier where we send the munitions from. Couldn't take pictures that way. So, we had really great results. The winning team got like four times the industry standard. And they actually brought it up to 10 times industry standard but then they found another problem because they were spitting the stuff on the ships so fast, the ships were listing. So that's why they had to back it off a little bit. And those guys are out in the market today doing this. We had seven teams do better than the industry standard in one, seven teams do better than the industry standard in the other, but only two teams that did better in both. And the rating, winning technology was rated very highly that year. There was a lot of hope with it. So we like to say that we put the theory into practice. We only, we didn't award all the prizes. We paid for success, only awarded first and second. We had seven million spent by the teams. 
the winning team said that it increased their innovation by about five years. They were working on this stuff, but they saw this thing and they said, oh, we can do this in 15 months. And the teams really were not doing it for the prize purse. Remember that tattoo artist and that basketball coach? They were doing it because they cared. Also still in the industry, by the way. Anybody see this? Yes. We had to I mean, so, so yeah, so the oil was used only for this. We used it through the whole competition, right? So we used the same oil, we pulled the oil out and put it back in, but at the end it was disposed of. No, but just in general. This, they're, they're oh, the ones different. out of Deepwater Horizon? I don't know. Do you know the answer to that? I doubt it. I assume it's all mixed with salt water and dead fish. So probably was, no, probably, no, yeah. No. So anybody see this? This is uh, Nat Geo's Planet Plastic Campaign. I worked on this. So we said, you know what, as part of all the other activities we're doing, let's go ahead and launch a challenge. And so we launched an ideas competition. So very different than coming up with a technology that is proven. And we want to do th three things. There are three different tracks. So alternatives to single-use plastic, industries changing their business model, think all these things like purple carrot, could they take their recyclables back, do it in a plastic thing or whatever it might be. Um, and, just as importantly, how do you visualize environmental data so the public takes action? We had really strong results. We're still judging the winners, but we had 291 teams submit solutions from 135 countries, which is 70% of the countries in this world. And 51% of our teams were female-led, which I think is pretty impressive, 135 countries and 51%. We got amazing media coverage, but what's most important is we hit the three targets we wanted to hit general public, because we want them to take action, the enviros, because we wanted to have this be actually believed to make a difference, and probably most importantly, the people that create the packaging, the industry, because they're the ones that have the capability to make a difference. They might make a difference if these people force it, right? They're not going to make a difference if these people force it. It'll make a difference if they change. So, Back to that first slide that I showed you. We get a portfolio of solutions. We get a diverse problem solver group. We activate and engage the public. We leverage our limited resources. And we only award when the solution is won, when the solution is provided, tested. So I'm going to pause there. Remember, the most important thing is this is one tool in your toolbox. It is not the tool. I literally argue with the Republicans in Congress all the time about this. It's one tool. It's a complementary tool. Any questions, comments, pushback? Oh, I'll tell you where it really sucks. Universities. We have a really, really hard time getting universities to compete. We always get a handful. Why? Because your whole funding model is totally different. You need a grant to do the work. But there's a bunch of universities out there that um, have successfully participated in NASA's challenges because the university itself is willing to write a check for $500,000 to fund the research. They hope they get paid back, but they're willing to invest in their organizations, which is not, I assume that's not very normal, right? <laughs> so it's very hard for university students and university professors to compete, so what we've done is we try to really support them. The thing about a prize is you have to be fair, but you don't have to be equitable, meaning you want to treat everybody fairly, but you don't have to treat everybody equally in the sense that you can do something different for universities to support them as long as you do it for all universities and not just one university. So, okay, now questions. Yeah. Yeah, so what do you do about conflict of interest? Because, like, going back to that plastic thing, at mm -hmm. a certain point, a lot of these prizes, I mean, industries are incentivized to sell as much as they can. Yep. They kind of want it. Yeah. So the third foot is inherent. Right. So one of the things you're doing is you're trying to change public perception. That's what's great about it, right? So the businesses want to sell as much as they can, yeah. but all of a sudden they get public pressure because you activate and engage the public. In theory, they may change, right? Also, same thing with the regulators. Can all of a sudden you have a stick because you proved that something was possible, right? Because a lot of times regulators say, we won't do this because it would cost too much money. Oh, wait, how do you ignore now that you have much faster oil spill technology that when the next oil spill happens, you don't use it you're, you're on the hook for being like, oh, we ignored the stuff that's working. So we try to do it from both the 
the regulated side, regulator side, and from the public side. But sometimes it doesn't work. Right? I mean. Do you ever use the conflict of interest as a point of like, like that might be a, a you know a lesson? You know, like, hey guys, here we uncovered this conflict. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when we design a prize, we try to bring all the different stakeholders in. We run a lot of facilitated sessions that get very heated sometimes, which I find totally entertaining actually. Um, and the idea is to kind of hash those things out, right? Uh, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. So uh, when I was at XPRIZE, it's still live. We launched a carbon capture and utilization prize. The idea here was, can you capture carbon dioxide from a power plant and recycle it into a usable product that has value? Not enhanced oil recovery, not straight sequestration. Actual something that has value. I guess it does for enhanced oil recovery, but we didn't let that happen. And the reason being was because there's no stick Right? There's no regulations in the US, and there's no carrot. In fact, it's a disincentive, because once you slap one of those things on there, you might put your air quality permit at risk, and you might cannibalize 30% of your power plant. Right? So when we were talking to the end users, they're like, I need to see it tested on a real power plant. And we're like, yeah, but none of you will let us test it on a real power plant, because you're afraid of losing your air quality permit. And when we talked to the, the potential competing teams, they're like, oh, I can show you a bench scale. So we had to figure that out. And what ended up happening, it's very expensive, the governor of Wyoming stepped up, and uh, whatever they have in Alberta, I can't remember what the person's called, yeah, they stepped up and said, in Alberta, we will build a natural gas plant. Well, we have a natural gas plant. We will move some of the ductwork down to ground level so we can test five teams in perpetuity, not just for this competition. So it created a carbon utilization center. And we're going to change our air quality permits to allow that risk to happen. In Wyoming, they did the same thing. Here's a coal plant. We'll bring some of that ductwork down. We'll reheat it so it's exactly what's coming out of a power plant. And we'll put it at ground level so then use. And we'll waive all these problems if there's some problems, right? And so we were able, we were actually able to test. And that one has had some really amazing results. And by the way, it's way more than just, it's way more than just cement. There's people making vodka. There's people making roofing shingles. So, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yes. Uh, you said uh, setting price is the one. One to of magnitude is complementary. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what would be the negative consequences if you overuse this tool? Oh, yeah. So the consequences of overusing the tool are very clear. One, uh, people don't design them well, so they get a lot of bad press. Right? So there's been a lot. There, the Virgin put out one about capturing uh, CO2, and they left it very wide open. You just had to capture something like, it was like a ridiculous number of tons. Like, Nobody could actually do it. And they left it wide open, so you couldn't actually judge it. So teams started suing because they're like, I captured all this. And Virgin's like, uh, I have no idea what you captured. right? So, so the risk of doing it is prize fatigue, right? Um, in the sense that either they're poorly designed or you're going to the same software pools over and over again. The other risk is that you are replacing things that really should be done by traditional grants or contracts. right? That, you know, you, again, basic research just doesn't work. You need, you need the government or others to fund to a certain point before the market's ready, right? We are that gap between that point and the market being ready, right? So, yes? So what happens with the other solutions that don't win the mm -hmm. second prize? Where, where does it go? Yeah, so, so it hopes that they still make it to market, right? The unfortunate thing about prizes is they're very, very good at, at vetting solutions. They're not good at all about vetting management teams. And we all know that the best innovators aren't the best business people sometimes, right? So a lot of times these things unfortunately die. So what we really try to do is we try to do a lot of mentoring um, of the teams in hopes that it will continue. We try to do things like put trade associations together. So that carbon prize um, that is live right now, we created, um, it just launched. Um, the, the Circular Carbon Network, which is like essentially a uh, collaboration of a bunch of uh, nonprofits, for profits, startups, blah, 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 to like create this economy, this, this carbon economy. Um, and so you can try to support it like that, but that's very hard, right? So the hope is that the market identifies the really cool solutions and then invests in it and takes it the same way that any startup would come through the market. Other questions here? Mm -hmm. Because I'm managing a small company, mm -hmm. but um, I'm working with outside uh, startups. Yep. Um, 
you know, testing verification, you said that how to the plane yeah. tested our technologies, right. basically, you know? And uh, so that's really important, testing mm -hmm. verification scale up. What do you think, um, how are, you know, some people do break it and like, uh, there's a parallel story, I'm sure you're familiar mm -hmm. with Elizabeth Holmes, right? That mm -hmm. story that everybody knows in the films and so she somehow was able to deceive Mm -hmm. Investors, decision makers. How to, uh, you know, the other side of the fence. How do you advise the others also uh, to be careful on, you know, decision makers, government, investors. Yeah. Uh, you know, how do you. Do so, you so we don't spend a lot of time with right. that, right? Because again, we are just showing that a technology is possible right. and then letting the market make those same decisions. Our hope is that by testing it and having independent third-party verified data, that that helps with the not pulling the wools over somebody's eyes. Now, somebody can cook their books. Somebody can say, I believe the market is five times the size that the market really is. Right? We can't control that. Right? We are about, this, we are about the technology itself and not necessarily about how the business goes forward. Now we try to work on that because we do try to send them to incubators, we do try to send them to accelerators, right? Or partner with those during the process so that they have that support. So unfortunately we don't, we don't focus on that piece. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it sounds like this is a very, uh, you know, a laser focused tool for getting specific mm -hmm. things to happen. Now in the context of climate change, mm -hmm. how do you feel about it? We have our planet, we got like what, 10, 12 years to really turn everything around mm -hmm. and Right. Yep. Yeah, what kind of tool would we need for that? And what, what it's a good question. <laughs> so I think this plays a part of it, right? Sure. I mean, even just the stuff that we're doing with National Geographic, right? The planetary plastics. The stuff that the Carbon X Prize is doing. Um, the stuff that Conservation X Labs has a cooling price for more efficient air conditioners, right? So, they're, yeah, they're, you're taking different bites out of the, the apple, right? Some small, some big. Um, which is, I think is good, right? Again, it's a complement to everything else you're doing and it allows you to have that portfolio of solutions. So the climate issue, yes, I study this in climate, but I don't know enough about it to, to fully answer your question. All I can say is that there's a lot going on, attacking it from different directions, hopefully with the support of everything else that's going on, right? And not in contradiction to it. So can I say, so my organization's footprint to wings, mm -hmm. we're Mm -hmm. So yes. right now we're rolling out this like, new idea, first gigawatt down. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a football game, right? Because if you're supposed to decarbonize, just, this is just the energy supply yeah, yeah. field. On the demand side, it would be first giga megawatt. Right? Yep. Okay. But um, the point is most people have no idea how big, how much energy you need. Right, right, right. A, and then they don't really know what's, what it takes to get one gigawatt. Mm -hmm. So we figure if like, just let's get everybody on the same page to understand the, yep. the scale. That might make every other prize like easier to adopt. Yep, and that's and that's we spend. I always tell my clients the first the first thing they get cut out of a budget when it's expensive is the marketing piece, and I said it's the worst piece you cut out. It, it hurts you two ways. One, it doesn't activate and engage the public and teach them about things like that. Two, the marketing piece is extremely valuable to the teams because if they are able to sh get press and stuff, then they're able to bring that to investors as a validation point, right? So, so I think. For what you're talking about, it's a lot about the marketing side of it. Yeah. Yeah. Getting yeah. Page yep. Yeah. That is yeah. I couldn't tell you what it. And I worked for a renewable energy company for many years. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. What, what type of uh, prices have you worked on that where the solution is open source as opposed to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot of them. Um, um, so, for example, that one I talked about in Tanzania. Um, the one that Elon Musk put up the money for, that was the solutions were completely open source to a degree. So the degree is we can only require the solutions to be open source through the end of the competition. Any other improvements that happen on it, because we can't control what happened. We, we owned everything in the competition and we put it out there, right? Um, anything that teams do after that is up to them. We can't, we don't have a legal right to forcing that to be open source. The difference was, and this, thank you for this question. When we did the uh, Barbara Bush Foundation Adult Literacy X Prize and the Global Learning X Prize, they were sister prizes. One was focused on adults in the US and one was focused on kids overseas. The, the Global Learning Prize was $15 million. 
the Adult Literacy Prize was $6 million. Why? Because we made that open source. So we had to give a lot more second place prizes and third place prizes and milestone prizes so that it was funding into a broader um, number of teams because I knew they were giving up their IP, right? Also, again, as I mentioned, they could close their IP after it was over and what was created during the competition stays out forever, right, open. Whereas on, on the um, Barber's side, we did it completely closed IP, though they, most of them gave us the IP afterwards um, or we partnered with them, we paid them for whatever it might be. But yeah, so, so software prize is very easy to do open source because the $15 million for a software prize is a lot. $15 million to build a technology that bolts onto a power plant, you're never gonna be able to open source that. So software, we often do open source. Hardware, we very rarely do open source. But do you think that the impact, the long-term impact of an open source solution or price is more than uh, source? Oh, of course, of course. I mean, open source in general, yes. Right, and in the context of climate change. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes, but you have to remember, how do you incentivize the teams, right? So if they're not willing to do that, you're going to have nobody. One thing I didn't mention is, um, I gave you the very basics on prizes. There's lots of different models. A lot of times we'll, we'll micro-prize something, meaning we'll just put out and say, we want it, this is the end goal, give us your piece of the solution. Somebody does that, they get a few thousand dollars, somebody adds on to it, iterates on it, they get a few, like, and you're micro-prizing each piece of it. So Essentially, you're creating one solution, or maybe five solutions. A lot of times we have things going on in parallel, but it's a global collaboration, right? It's everybody is kind of feeding into it. Um, other times, we'll, we milestone prizes, and we don't necessarily expect the same teams to continue. So if this team gets to here, say it's an ideas competition, we actually say, if you don't bring that forward, that is open to anybody else to take, right? And then another team could take it and t bring it forward. Um, so there's lots of ways to play with that. I think we maybe have time for one or two more questions. No? Well, thank you. Hopefully you learned something. Um, and if you have any questions, my email is super easy. Just chris at chrisrangeron.com. Feel free to reach out. Um, so thank you. I appreciate it.